everybody. Welcome to the Cannabis Wiki Conference and Expo 2022 from London, Ontario. We got a lot of new hot interviews coming up next. See you on the green room. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the green room. Uh, this was Derek's intro that I just jumped in. It's okay, Jackie. Yum. <laughs> Welcome to the green room, everybody. And uh, yeah, we're at the first Cannabis Wiki Conference and Expo. And uh, yeah. How, how are you feeling, Jackie? Super excited. That's why I jumped into the intro like that. The first mm -hmm. ever Cannabis Wiki Conference and Expo, and we're at the Western Fair District, uh, London, Ontario, Southern Ontario. This is really fun. I'm super excited to introduce our next guest is George Smitherman from the Cannabis Council of Canada. Woo. Hello, George. Hey, how are you? Good. How are you? The dream is alive. <laughs> <laughs> happy, happy cannabis wiki. Yay, this it really is. This was just a dream uh, three years ago. We kept mentioning it and mentioning it, and then here we are. I really love the, I uh, really love the uh, format as uh, I think there's a, a huge missing gap of being able to get more uh, bud tenders and retailers engaged with uh, other people in the sector. So I'm really looking forward to the kind of engagement that we've already started to have over at our booth. Yeah, it's exciting. There's a vibe here today when we were coming in. I was super excited. It feels different. And, and it's hot. Yeah. Hot outside. Oh, it's hot outside. <laughs> <laughs> so we met, we had met once before. We had done a roundtable discussion. Um, at, that the was, at, at the Elma Combo. At the Elma Ooh. Combo. <laughs> yeah. We did a, a roundtable discussion. Now we're, now we're in another uh, venerable institution here at the Western Fairground. Yeah. yeah. Haven't they been in business over 150 years or That's something right. here? Yeah. So cool. So George, tell us what the uh, Cannabis Council of Canada does and uh, what do you do with them? The Cannabis Council of Canada is the National Industry Association and we uh, bang away every day at uh, government and regulators trying to improve the commercial conditions under which our uh, license holders are operating. Not for the faint of heart, this Canadian <laughs> cannabis environment. So no shortage of work for us to do to try and build on the obvious uh, strengths that have occurred since legalization. Definitely. When you said no, not for the faint of heart. What's something you're coming to often? What's something you're hearing over and over again? Uh, well, I'm hearing over and over and over again, uh, sadly, from companies that are very, very uncertain about their future, that uh, sustainability amongst the billions of dollars of investment that have occurred is a, is a very, very serious threat. And that's why we've brought so much attention to the extent to which government excise taxes, fees, and distribution markups are crowding out the mm -hmm. le are crowding out the legal players, are crowding out the growers, and in some cases, probably also crowding out the retailers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the you know, it's hard for them to make money and compete. So you know, what what is the reform that you're looking for? Well, we brought forward at our recent Grass on the Hill conference in Ottawa, which we had two days, uh, a leadership conference, and then we put people to the, to the task of going on to Parliament Hill, meeting with members of Parliament and key influencers. And we brought forward kind of a list of what we describe as five key asks or five big asks. The first of those is help us on financial viability. That's about the excise tax. It's about that excise stamp. It's about the uh, fees that we pay on the regulatory basis, etc. We look for uh, more ability to have compete on a level playing field with the illicit market, which is super well entrenched. Mm -hmm. They're online. <laughs> We're not. A uh, variety of uh, challenges like that, including the restrictions that we have on even just communicating with our consumers in age-gated environments about the attributes of our products. Right. Uh, the regulatory burden that we face and some of the nanny state regulation, for instance, the 10 milligram per package cap on THC in, uh, in edibles right. is uh, basically like conceding a whole market category to the illicit market. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, and uh, restoring patient access. So I try to cover cover the five, I didn't enumerate them perfectly there, but there's a basket of things. And really in a certain sense, what we're trying to create in Ottawa is multiple lanes mm -hmm. to try and find resolution to various challenges. We've been promised that statutory review. It's late and when it does get going, it's gonna be very slow. So we've tried to say to the government, like that's a slow boat and there may be issues there that we need to address there, but we have a matter of 
pressing urgency right. and we need some resolution on a variety of these fronts if we're going to achieve the objectives of legalization in the first place. No, that makes a lot of sense because how can you compete where the uh, illicit market could have, say, a thousand milligram uh, chocolate bar and, you know, you can only have uh, 10 here? I don't know. Like, I've heard it from a lot of people, friends of mine or what have you, that are uh, longstanding legacy consumers like mm -hmm. myself who are getting their dry flour from the legal market, but continuing to get their edibles from their traditional legacy providers. And Well, that makes know, sense, yeah. To, if you look at it like in a mature market, say like Colorado or California, as compared to Canada, there's a significantly greater market share in edibles. Mm -hmm. And we think at the moment that stands as about a 350 or $400 million loss annually, oh. that would really, really help to lift a lot of boats. So right. that's a key priority for us, pressing the government to allow us at least 100 milligrams within one package, 10 items, possibly one item scored. Colorado model probably standing as an example that we would highlight to them as one that is more effective at addressing the challenge of bringing people over from the illicit market and at the same time uh, uh, being able to uh, being able to uh, offer you know a, a, a product which is uh, uh, compliant with uh, safety concerns and all of that and that's the other thing that we've seen we've seen numerous studies over the last year or two coming out of British Columbia, Ontario, and the East Coast, where they've tested illicit market edibles, and they're all they're all on board with things that aren't supposed to be there, and there's a lot of- Like what, like what? Well, like, um, like uh, mold, like pesticides, uh, like- uh, Right, because right. uh, it's not being lab tested. Right, exactly, exactly. And some of, you know, and some of the, some of what's going on there is people are buying like street, literally street candy and spraying THC oh, yeah. distillate on it and stuff like yeah. that. And that's the kind of dangerous. stuff that's really uh, dangerous Even, uh, for consumers the trademarks and for and kids. Stuff too. Yeah, all of that kind of infringement. So we have a really, really strong motivation to win this category back. We told Health Canada that the effect of your 10 milligram rule is to concede an enormous profitable market category to the illicit market. So we're yeah. very intent to I try like and, that point. We're very intent to try and bring more of that market into the fold of the legal players. That's a lot of companies that supply really great and innovative products. Right. And obviously every retailer would benefit from selling more uh, more edibles products. So that's a key priority that we're very focused on. We think that's an example of a nanny state rule where we got legalization, but we have kind of prohibition by regulation. And right. some of this needs to let go. Health Canada established the precautionary principle in a very risk averse place. That's natural when you're starting out with legalization. Now we have three or four years under our belt and it's time for some recalibration on some of these, uh, on some of these matters. Absolutely. Your slogan, license regulated trusted, that's trust is a huge part of the, the trouble we're having in the industry. Who do we trust? Who do we go to? Who do we like? Don't you agree? That's a, the trust issue, the trust factor. The I mean, we came from legacy every, for, for the most part. We've and that, there's trust issues, right, that we have with government and politicians. And when you are do you tell people that you are a consumer of cannabis, that you're a long time lover and whatever. So do you run I into wrote, problems with I wrote, that? I wrote, I wrote a book where I had uh, called uh, Unconventional Candor, my memoir, which mm. covered my life in politics and my life with drugs. And, you know, I condensed Were that. Were you doing both at the same time? No, oh. uh, no, but uh, um, no, well, cannabis, yes. But I, I also profiled a period of time when I used harder drugs before uh, I was in elected. Did you know Rob elected, Ford? Elected office. I lost an election to Rob Ford, oh, one yeah. of the many traumas that I've suffered. Thank you for raising it. Oh no! <laughs> I did, and I'm only halfway. Sorry about that. I'm only halfway kidding. I don't, I'm only halfway <laughs> kidding. The post-traumatic <laughs> stress disorder of uh, losing, and I, I gave up a good job to run for mayor of Toronto. Ended up losing to Rob Ford, and I suffered the indignity of spending a hundred nights with him. Uh, in all candidates meetings, which is uh, really not something that one gets over to uh, <laughs> gets over to readily. But in all seriousness, with respect, to, like I did, I did have a pattern of hard drug use in my life. And I talked in my book about how cannabis for me was an off ramp. 
right. it was an off ramp for opioid Me use. Too. Right. That's not necessarily. Well, for why everybody. does the government always say it's an on ramp, a well, gateway? Why was I, all of that, you know, propaganda? I tell them, I tell them actually, you know what? Where you deny legal access, mm -hmm. it is a gateway because I definitely had relationships with individuals that would drop by my home that were offering products of a variety of different colors, if you follow me. Yes. Yeah. And that's obviously not the case. But in, most people you know, who do offers don't want to do cannabis, which is more of a downer. Sometimes you need the night to end. Yeah, sometimes you need oh, both. I see. Okay. <laughs> and we're, hence we're, my book. <laughs> we're, we're getting a little bit close to too much information. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. Tell, will you tell our tell listeners? Us, I how, think j j just on that story, yeah? j just to make a really, really important point sure. in the context of opioid replacement. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have people, uh, young people, largely uh, falling in every province uh, to premature death. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's some, re you know, when I talk about enhanced patient access for cannabis, uh, I think about that as a carve out within a national pharma care program. Mm -hmm. We did polling recently, uh, showed huge percentages of support for medicinal cannabis to be paid for by government for certain indications. Mm -hmm. But what I think what we're trying to bring a focus on with our Grass on the Hill event this fall. Mm -hmm. in the when is that? Well, I don't have the date yet. It's okay. going to be between October 17th and November 7th. So we zone in on when the parliamentarians are there. Right. And then we'll bring more and more people to go and have those meetings with MPs. But one of the things that I hope we can bring focus to is some of the great research that's going on demonstrating good, positive, effective cannabis in the context of opioid replacement. And I note that here at the conference, uh, Entourage is here. Yep. They're closely aligned with Leuna, the building trades union. Yep. And uh, they've been doing, they've been supporting important research in this area. Shout amongst, out Leuna. Others. <laughs> yeah, yeah they're actually, actually our uh, premier sponsor and they were supposed to be uh, over there, but some there's, unfortunate. There's been a couple unfortunates. <laughs> yeah. Well, so Le, they'll be know, here next year. Le, Leuna, obviously, like Leuna is a powerful as a powerful force. Absolutely. The data clearly shows us that the people that are dying from opioid use uh, uh, in Canada, mm -hmm. uh, they, 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 they profile to be youthful men in a lot of cases and a lot of and there are a lot of addiction issues within the building trades. And I think that they're an important partner for the Definitely. cannabis uh, for the cannabis industry. So that's something that I'm really looking that we looking to see that we could profile more. Definitely, and I I agree. And I I know a lot of them, the Luna guys personally, and they're really they 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 let's say love cannabis. They appreciate it. They respect it. They understand it. So, which is well, and they're deeply invested in deep, it. So. And deeply <laughs> invested in it. Yeah. <laughs> Can you tell us some of the like things that you've won, like? Some of the successes. Sure. Well, the Cannabis Council has been around, uh, started back sort of around 2014 when the former Harper government forced, first created the model for licensed producers in the context of medicinal cannabis. And it's 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 evolved over time. I've been at the helm since March two, March 2nd, 2020. Uh, which kind of coincides with uh, the arrival of COVID. Oh. Um, but it, it, so in that time frame, uh, to be to be sure, it's uh, it's been challenging to get progress with government. But some of the things that we have been able to win is the hard fought victory to uh, address the equivalency problem with the beverages. Mm. So when these guys uncork the formula, creating equivalency formulas right. to your 30 grams of dry flour, mm -hmm. they somehow decided that the weight of the water in a beverage should keep you away from it right and so that category has been you know basically yep. uh, basically suppressed they made a commitment to us last year that they would come forward with the regulation change which they have posted they put this thing through so many rounds of consultation it's like a heavyweight match and we're putting as much pressure on them right now to say why don't you just uncork the reg that you've shown everybody and no one has any big quarrel with it so that's an example but even yeah. there very slow to materialize, but before too long, the consumer ought to be able to get 48 cans, not ah. five, which yeah. is uh, which is, proper which, was is telling which is a significant step up. 
Yeah. Um, in the recent budget, you saw the government made some commitments to excise changes. Right now, if you're a co, you know, a lot of our cannabis products involve more than one set of hands before they ship mm -hmm. to a consumer. But moving that product around, even be between licensed providers, is incredibly challenging in the construct within the law. Oh it's my really goodness! It's really funky. So the government's committed to bring in changes to the Excise Act this fall, which will be beneficial to a lot of people that are involved in co-packing and stuff like that. Mm, we saw the commitment that they made to creating an industry strategy table at I said at the industry department. This is noteworthy because we haven't had anybody in the government that's been willing to put their arms around us and say, why don't we see what we can do to grow this thing? Or right. What have you. It's mostly been, we don't want you to do too well. Don't yeah. be getting any new customers. Here's my thumb, and stay under it. And here's a new and here's a new regulation for you to live with. So oh. it's, ref it's refreshing and hopeful in that sense. But at the end of the day, what I mentioned to you before is, the urgency with which the industry needs to see change in action means we need to fight hard to create laneways. I tell people it's not one single lane where you have five or six issues. I said, think of it like the 401 through Toronto. Mm -hmm. You got to get a new, you know, you want to make a progress and change here. We got to create a live active lane and find somebody that's willing to make the change because not all, not everything that we do runs right up the food chain. Sometimes to the one 401 person. is backed up though. Can we be the it's, 407? It is, um, I should just say multi-lane highway, okay? Because okay. you make an excellent, you do make an excellent point. You do make an excellent point, but really the sense of urgency that we have dictates that we have to be very careful mm -hmm. about getting sucked into false process because it is possible for government, even if it's well-intentioned- No, don't tell us to that. Create fake, well -intended to create- Well-intended government. To create kind of uh, processes that can use up a lot of time and a lot of energy. Yeah. And frankly speaking, that's something that our sector doesn't have a lot of extra free to give away. Isn't it hard though to get the government to actually say, like once they're good at taking the tax, but then if you want them to, you know, ease that, that's very hard. Almost like, yes, that is almost as hard, I tell people, as trying to amend the Canadian constitution. <laughs> but, there's, right. but there's one thing in our favor. Okay. And this is the work that we're doing right now with EY, that Ernst & Young, that big mm -hmm. accounting firm. They did yep. the first phase of a tax study and they're working on the second one. And the second one is grow the pie. Because the one thing that we've got going for us is We've only gathered up about half of the business right. under the regulated, <laughs> regulated. Uh, so you think half? I think about half. Mm -hmm. Some, you know, Quebec tries to pretend that they <laughs> practically, practically <laughs> got it all or what have you. But to me, the the, re the the data is quite poor. So you got to be a little careful to glom on to any one study or report. Right. But looking at them all, I'd say it's around half. So we can stop now and say we're satisfied at half no. and here's the tax pie. Right. Or we can say back off a little, let's do some things together in partnership and go and get 70 or 80 percent of this market under under the legal umbrella because we have the innovative products. We, yeah. have, we have the retail networks. We've done so many pieces of it. So our argument would be. You started out saying this was going to be a 10% tax. It's coming in at 25 to 40. Back it off. And the provinces know that they're making out like bandits. That doesn't even count the money that they make at the distribution markup. Like right. OCS is just another tax. Yeah, right. they're making sure. But they're you know how they move. The it's the same as uh, casinos, right? It's like uh, they bring in the casinos and then they made all the money and then, you know, but they have the, are you a gambler? Call this hotline. And then finally they realize, okay, it's a Know your of, limit, play know within your it. Limit. Yeah. Now they, they, you know, they sold it off to the private, but they kept the website. Um, and, you know, it's just, I don't know. I, I think that the, the way forward, like I love the, the edible reform. I think that you can gain a lot of market share there. And, um, you know, but it's just, yeah. I to love get the them book. to give back money. It's like, we're making this much. I get what you're saying, because you're saying, hey, let you're going to have more market share, so you're actually going to make more we're gonna by that, reducing it. We're going to grow that makes, pie together. It makes common sense what you're saying. And more employment and more of the indirect taxes also that starts to count up, not just the excise. But, right. th but you know, to your early point was, there, 
they're not going to be keen to do that give back. Right. That puts pressure on us to be very, very effective, both in the development of our plan. Right. And actually the work that we're prepared to do as an industry to go out and, and, and get it done. And that's the point I would really like to emphasize is a lot of industries are regionally centered. Our industry is everywhere. Right. And if we leverage those relationships with members of parliament, using the idea that all politics is local, which is very true, we can create quite a lot of awareness and I'd say even a little bit of sympathy maybe for the circumstances that we face as an sympathy. industry within, sympathy. Within, within, within parliament. And, and when we had grass on the hill a couple of weeks ago, we sent out groups of people to dozens of different meetings and the relationships that they began to establish, you can already see the benefits. People are now being invited to come and tour a facility that's in their riding and that heretofore they'd never known about it, et cetera. So we, I know that it's challenging out there for the license holders because many of them are struggling just to keep their eyes above the water. Right, right. I, yes. I and they're the ones that are, are kind of um, reducing their prices so that the market, so they're, you know, they're the pushing it forward yeah. and the government's not helping them. Well, actually, like if you look at the dry flower pricing and the way that that has degraded over a couple of years, that's basically been cannabis investors subsidizing cannabis consumers. Right. Because the LPs had their prices constricted, that grew the government share in the overall, in the overall pie. And obviously, practically nobody in our industry is profitable, much less cash flow positive. So this is an unsustainable, an unsustainable scenario. But we really need those people, those license holders, those 800 of them to go out and meet their member of parliament. Right. When I run into them, the first question I ask them is, who's your member of parliament? To try and let them know is like- Peter Fragiscano and great. Ariel Kayabaga. That's great. And you know- On speed uh, dial. And- um, <laughs> And uh, the the uh, London Fanshawe MP, mm -hmm. who's from another political per persuasion, um, we reached out to her. She had to cancel her meeting, but subsequently she invited uh, two license holders that were that were there in Diva, which is London uh, yeah. London yep. based, and also Saint uh, Saint Thomas based, based Sensi Brands yep. are going to have a follow up meeting with uh, Lindsay, okay. and they're going to go and tour her facility. Nice. So this is just a progress perfect, perfect example of it. But we need that replicated a hundred and two hundred times over in our country. So license holders don't be, need to be a member of the Cannabis Council of Canada to glom on to some of our advocacy tools. We really need people to go out and leverage that personal relationship they have with their local member of parliament. Mr. Smitherman, we could talk to you forever and ever, but can you shout out your book again and how we can find you and what's the website for the Cannabis Council? Sure, the Cannabis Council website is cannabis-council.ca. And um, my book is called uh, Unconventional, Can uh, Unconventional Candor. And mm. I'm pretty sure you can find that in the discount bin or at Amazon. Whatever. You, I would uh, like to look for that. Or find at Amazon. That. You narrate uh, the audio book? Am Amazon if you want. Wouldn't I have not narrated an audio book. Wouldn't, mm. wouldn't that, oh, listen, we're in court all of a sudden. I have not narrated an audio book <laughs> 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 at any time in my life. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, George Smitherman from the Cannabis Council of Canada. Thanks for fun. all you do. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks Thank for joining you. us. Bye.